22. Sorry for the slight delay, but I felt it was better to let Arthur continue a bit because of the, the technical issues. Um, so what I'm going to do today um, is, you remember I sent around an email uh, to ask you what topics you thought were most difficult and you'd like me to go through. So based on that feedback that I got, I wrote essentially an exam in exactly the same style as this year's exam uh, that goes through those topics in order of the most difficult of the one you wanted to see first. And then I work through that. Hopefully I'll get the whole exam finished, but that just depends on the number of questions that people have as we go on. Uh, so obviously it's a completely new set of questions. So you can have a go at them outside of this session as well. If everyone has, if someone's not got one, there's a paper copy, there's a few paper copies left down here at the bottom. <clears throat> also, excuse me, I'm going to sit during most of this session because I'm going to be writing on the visualizer. If I bend over for an hour and a half, I'm not going to be able to walk <laughs> after this session. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> So the front of the exam paper is exactly the same as you'll see, so you'll get three questions, it's three compulsory questions. Someone told me it's working. I assume it's working. So there'll be three questions. They're all compulsory. They're all worth the same amount of marks each. So I'd advise you to not spend more than half hour on each question the first time, and then go back to anything you've not done if you've got time. As you open the paper, you'll see a list of useful equations for the paper. So you can see the type of equations that I'm putting. So I'm not going to give you very simple equations like relative volatility uh, or um, recovery or something like that because they're simple and you should know those equations. Yeah? Is this the same set as the actual example? <laughs> it's not the same set as in the exact actual exam. Um, the, it, it's modified basically so that it's only got the equations that you actually need for the exam, rather than like having a, a huge list and it being really confusing. So it will be slightly different, but it's of exactly the same style of equations that you'll get. You can also see last year's uh, exam paper as well, so you can just see the, the site differences. So rather unsurprisingly, the, uh, the topic that won out in terms of what you wanted to see most was azeotropic distillation, both plotting approximate residue curves and also then designing azeotropic distillation systems. So we've got our first question, so it tells us that we've got a mix, a feed that's 50% A and 50% B, and that we want to separate it by distillation. Unfortunately, as is the way with all of these things, we've got an azeotrope that forms at 70% A, so it makes using simple distillation impossible. So we've decided that we're going to actually add an entrainer to our system, 
but that's typically is the way that in trainer doesn't form an azeotrope with one of our components, but with our, but with our other component, component A, that also happens to form an azeotrope. So that's quite a common thing to occur in industry. <clears throat> So part A asks us to use the information we actually have to draw an approximate residue curve for the system. So what we can do first is actually write, what I'd recommend is writing down all the information that we actually know for our system so that we actually have that available. So we're told that we have a component A and it has a boiling point of 110, component B, boiling point of 150. They form an azeotrope, which has a boiling point of 100 degrees, so we can immediately see from that information that that must be a minimum boiling azeotrope. Oops. We have an entrainer, pours at 130 degrees C, and we're told that that forms an azeotrope with just our A component, <coughs> and that boils at 140 degrees, and you can see there from E and A that that one must be a maximum boiling azeotrope. <coughs> So what we need to do is start to draw our approximate residue curve. <clears throat> so if you remember the instructions that we went through in the lectures, we have to go through those nine steps. So we start by labelling all of our components and their properties actually on our diagram. Right, so we know that A is 10, E is labelled for you in this corner, 130, and B is 150. Right, we have an azeotrope between A and B at 70% A. So we know it's only between A and B, so it has to be on this axis here. And it's at 70% A, so we can just count up 50, 60, 70%. So that's our AB azeotrope. And that's 100 degrees C. And between A and E, so on this axis, we also have our azeotrope, and that's at 50% A, 50%. So that's our A, E azeotrope, and that's at 140 degrees. <coughs> okay. So we can also record the fact that we have two binary azeotropes. So our B value is equal to, okay? <clears throat> so our second step is to start to put arrows on the side of our diagram between these, these points. And if you remember for a residue curve, the arrows point from the coldest to the hottest, okay? <clears throat> so if we start at this AB azeotrope, it's warmer as we move towards our component A. Then it's hotter if we move towards our AE azeotrope. <clears throat> then in that case, it's warmer towards our AE azeotrope again. <clears throat> it's warmer in the direction of B. And again, in this case, our azeotrope's a minimum azeotrope. So we can come round <clears throat> to be. So now we've drawn our arrows on, we can assign 
the types of singular points we have for our pure components. So if we start with A, we can see we've got one entering and one exiting A okay, of our residue curves. So that makes that a saddle. Yep. <clears throat> so it's an S1. We then have E, so we have two, both our residue curves are leaving E, so that must make it a node. It also happens to be a stable node. Sorry, uh, <clears throat> an unstable node, but we can write that as node one. And then our B, we have our residue curves both coming into B. So again, that's a node, and that what happens to be a stable node. Okay? Now we can also, we now also know that we have two of our nodes, first order nodes, and one of our first order saddles. Okay, so does that make sense so far? Yep. So if we remember back to our steps, the next step was to actually look through and examine to see if we had a ternary azeotrope, and then if we had a ternary azeotrope, we'd, we'd do some steps on that, but we don't have any ternary, ternary azeotropes, okay? So we get to stick, skip those steps, and then we can move straight on to step six. So step six is where we actually use our knowledge of the topological equation to work out how many second order nodes, uh, binary, um, binary nodes and binary saddles we have. So if we quickly flip back to our list of useful equations, you'll find the topological equation written down for you, so you don't need to remember that one. And what we want to do is, because we know our number of ternary nodes and saddles, our total number of binary azeotropes, and our number of single point nodes, we can just rearrange this equation for our number of binary nodes. So we've got no ternaries of any type. We've got two binary azeotropes and we've got two single point nodes. So that means that our number of binary nodes is just one. We also know that, of course, the total number of binary azeotropes must be equal to the number of binary nodes and the number of binary saddles we have. So we can rearrange that. And we know we have two binary azeotropes in total. And we've just calculated we've got one binary node. So we must have one binary saddle. So our AE azeotrope and our AB azeotropes, one must be a node and one must be a saddle. So the thing we now want to do is think about our, our checks that we do on the system to make sure that this is a system we can solve. Uh, a little hint. I'm not going to give you a system you can't solve, uh, but we still want to do the checks. Uh, so if you do the check and you calculate that it's a system that can't be solved, it's, in this case it's not a problem with the data, it's a problem with what you've done. So that's a quick check, you, an internal check you can do yourselves to make sure that you're 
going down the correct route. So what we do is we can rank all our singular points in order of their boiling point. And then what we want to do is count the number of intermediate boiling binary azeotropes we have. So we've got two binary azeotropes, but our AB is not an intermediate because it's at our lowest boiling temperature. So we just have one intermediate boiler. And then we can look at our checks. So that's our checks. We know we've got two binary, one intermediate boiler, and one binary node. So that is true. We know we've got one binary saddle and one intermediate boiler. So that is true. So we've got a system that we can actually solve. <coughs> And we also know if it has a unique solution that our number of intermediate boilers must equal the number of binary saddles. So in this case, we have one equals one. So that's true, so we know we have a unique solution. Again, I'm only gonna give you an example that has a unique solution. So that's another check you can do to make sure you've essentially assigned all the points correctly as you're going along. We also know that as we have one, as we have one binary saddle, we must have one distillation boundary because the number of distillation boundaries is equal to the number of binary saddles we have. Okay. <clears throat> So we move on to our final step, and our final step is trying to put in our distillation boundary. So what we do is we try to, to join our binary azeotropes up to all of the other points that we potentially can, all of our nodes that we potentially can join them up to. So if we start with our a B azeotrope, I won't draw it in, it's a subtle hint that it might be wrong, but uh, if you were to think about that, you've, you've got a line that would come out of our A B azeotrope, and the arrow direction would be pointing to our node. So we would have a, we would have a stable node, and a saddle, and a <clears throat> And a primary and you can't join those together but if we try to join our AE azeotrope the only option we've got for our, our primary points that it's not already joined to is obviously our component B so if we draw if we were to draw this <coughs> we would have a distillation boundary that does this. And what we would have, we would have a maximum boiling saddle. And if you remember, a maximum boiling binary saddle must be joined to a stable node at a higher temperature. So we already know it's a stable node and it's at a higher temperature, okay? So out of our two options, that's the only option that actually works. So that's our distillation boundary. Okay, yep. Could you not join the two uh, binary groups together? You don't join. Um, <clears throat> you don't. So, so the problem with that is, is that it must. 
the, the binary saddle, it would still, uh, if, you join the, if you join the two azeotropes together, you would then end up with uh, both, both azeotropes being nodes. First of all, we know that can't be true because one must be a saddle, one must be a node. And also, one would be a stable node and one would be an unstable node, and you can't join a stable to an unstable node. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry. If you wanted to, you could draw a few rough residue curves on there, but I'm happy with just identifying where the distillation boundary is and having the arrow on the distillation boundary. <coughs> So long as it, so long as it's clear what you've done, you don't, you don't need to write like a paragraph of a company text with it saying, "I have looked at the nodes and the arrows all point in, therefore it is a." Yeah, I would take that bit for granted. So long as you label them the right thing, yeah. Okay. So if we move, if we move on to part B. So part B is saying that now we've actually drawn our approximate residue curve. Let's actually use that residue curve to start to design our distillation separation for the feed that we're actually told. So the first thing we want to do is look at the information. So if we go back to the start of our question, we're told that we have a, we have a 50, 50 mix of A in B. So the feed is 50% A, 50% B, okay? If we also read through B, we find that, okay, as we expect, we're adding our entrainer to our feed. But what we're told is that the recycled stream, the flow rate of the recycled stream, is equal to the flow rate of the feed stream. Okay, so that's an important piece of information for when we actually come to design the system on our diagram. <coughs> so of course the first thing that we do is sketch out our distillation system because what it does is it asks you to label all the streams <coughs> On your, on your schematic, okay? So obviously we have our feed coming in. Then I've just put our first one as S1. We have our D1, D2, D2, D1, okay? from the diagram that we're given in the question, we already know that our D2 stream must be our pure component A, and that our B1 stream must be pure component B. And if we look at our, our residue curve that we've already drawn, what you'll immediately see from this is that 
we can't treat recycling pure in trainer because we've got a distillation boundary in the way. So what we're actually doing is homogeneous azeotropic distillation. So what we're recycling around is that azeotrope of A and E, the mix of A with the entrainer. Okay? So that means that our B2 stream must be our A, E and trainer azeotrope. Okay? And we can also, of course, relate that back up here because we're recycling B2. <coughs> so we can increase the information that the flow rate of the feed must be equal to the flow rate of B2. So if we want to start drawing our system on our ternary diagram, so we start by putting on our feed point, which we know is 50-50 of A and B. So that's our feed point. And the first operation we have is this mixing point to get our S1. We know what we're mixing it with is our A azeotrope and we know that all mass balances on the ternary diagram are a straight line. So we know that our mixing point must be represented by that straight line. Now we can go to our useful information that F equals B2, which tells us by the lever arm rule that if the flow rates are equal, then the length of the lines from the components to the mix to the mix point must also be equal. So we know the point of our S2. In this case it's what about four centimeters, but is directly in the middle of this <coughs> line. So that is our S1 point. Okay? We can now think about drawing our first column onto the system. So we've been told in the question that the, the bottom product is pure B and it must pass through our S1 point. So because it's a mass balance, again, it's a straight line. So we can draw a straight line that passes between, passes from B through our S1 point. And in this case, what we've chosen to do is go on the residue curve that goes right round the outside and on the distillation boundary. So you can see that line I've just drawn is on that exterior residue curve. So this point here is our B1. This point here is our D1. Okay, and then the line is our column one. Sorry. Down a bit. Okay. So we now want to draw our second column on our diagram. So we know that the feed into that column is our D1. We know that our bottom product is our AE azeotrope. 
Okay, and we want A to come over out of that, the top product. So again, we can draw a straight line and you can see that in this case, we're right on the exterior residue curve with our mass balance line. So our AEA isotrope, that's our B2, and our A, that's our D2, and this line is our column two. Okay, so what we've done there is represented that that system on on our turning diagram. Okay. So again, that's all I'm looking for in that question. Yep. So, if this is our initial system, from column one we've been told we're getting B, and from column two we're told we're getting A, okay? So if we use our information about extractive distillation, we know therefore that we, what we must be recycling has to involve the entrainer, right? because that's what we're recycling to allow us to do the separation. If we look at the residue curve that we've just drawn, our A point is here and our B point is here. Yep. And we've got a distillation boundary. So we can't cross that distillation boundary during our distillation. So, we can't be recycling pure entrainer because it sits on the other, in the other region. So we think about what, what topics we looked at, what methods we looked at for separating uh, azeotropes. So the first one was, was just recycling pure entrainer. Well, we can't do that. The next method was homogeneous azeotropic distillation. In homogeneous azeotropic distillation, we recycle the azeotrope of the entrainer plus one of the components. So that would be that point there. And obviously they are in the same region. So that's a possibility. The other possibility we had is heterogeneous azeotropic distillation. Heterogeneous azeotropic distillation needs a heterogeneous azeotrope but we're not given any information about any liquid-liquid equilibrium at all. So it's highly unlikely that it is a heterogeneous azeotrope because, to be honest, I would have mentioned it in a question. Uh, <clears throat> so it must be a homogeneous, so we need to use a homogeneous azeotropic distillation technique. Okay? that we've got a saturated liquid feed of butane and propylene and if we want to separate this using a distillation column and then we're given the specification of the top and the bottom product and then we're told the temperatures of the top and the bottom of the column and then we're given some information about the saturated vapour pressure of our two components 
And then part A says, well, what is the average relative volatility of propylene to butane based on the top of the bottom product condition? Okay? So, the first thing that I would recommend doing, so you don't get confused, is to just draw a little sketch of the distillation column yeah, we're talking about. So we're told that we've got 20% butane, and so therefore we must have 80% propylene in our system. We're told that our overhead product is 99% propylene, so therefore must be 1% butane and our bottom product is 97% butane so it must be 3% propylene okay we we're also told the temperature at the top of the column that's 312 Kelvin and the temperature at the bottom of the column 364 Kelvin. Okay? So that just allows us to keep track of that key information. So the question asks us to calculate the relative volatility based on the top and the bottom. So what do we need to calculate the relative volatility? We need the saturated vapor pressures of both of the components. And we're given equations, we're given this equation here for the, relative, the saturated vapor pressure of both of the components. So if we think first about the top of the column, then we can use our propylene equation. And we use the temperature of the top of the column for this. So that's 16.6 .6 kPa at the top of our column. We can also look at the saturated vapor pressure of butane for the top of our column. And again, the temperature at the top of the column. And the relative volatility at the top is essentially the ratio between these two vapor pressures. Okay. And we can also repeat this for the bottom of our column using the temperature for the bottom Again, our relative volatility is the ratio of these two saturated vapor pressures. <coughs> and what it does is it asks us to calculate the average based on the top and the bottom. So we remember that our average 
we take as a square root of the top times by the square root of the bottom top times by the bottom. Okay, so 3.4 at the top, 3 at the bottom, and that gives us an average relative volatility of 3.18. Okay, so does that, that make sense? <clears throat> so part B of the question, asks us to work out the minimum reflux ratio required to achieve the separation. So if we go back to the start of our question, one of the crucial bits of information that we notice is that it starts off by saying a saturated liquid feed, okay? So immediately we can write down that for a saturated liquid feed, Q equals one, okay? So it's asked us to calculate the minimum reflux ratio. So, We can go back to our list of useful equations and we can see that we've been given the Underwood equations which we can use to find this minimum reflux ratio. So we can write out for our system, so 1 minus Q, which must be equal to 0 because that Q equals 1. <clears throat> and we know that it's the sum of all our components with relative volatility and the fraction in the feed over the relative volatility minus a diparameter. Okay? <clears throat> So in this case, we've got two components. So we'll be looking for two terms in our Underwood equation. The first one is for our propylene. So we know that the relative volatility of propylene to butane is 3.18 because we've just calculated that in a previous question times by the fraction of propylene in the feed which is 0.8 and then we have the same term for our second component which is our butane so we've used butane as our reference component for the propylene, so we need to use butane as a reference component for our second component, which is butane. So we're looking for the relative volatility of butane to butane, which is one, because the relative volatility of anything to itself is one, times by the fraction of butane in the feed, which is 0.2. <clears throat> Then what we can do is because we've only got two components, it's possible to solve this system by hand. So 3.18 times 0.8 is 2.54 minus psi plus 0.2, 3.18 minus psi, 
Okay, so what I've done is just cross multiply to get a single fraction. The bottom of this fraction just cancels out because it goes to zero. So all we're left with is zero equals 2.54 1 plus 0.2 that so all we have to do is solve that simple equation and we're left with our fight is 1.159 yeah so basically every question that's actually uh no so it is still physically possible to solve if q doesn't equal 1 because if you look at that expression there oh. uh, in the right in the you mean here yeah you'll always have one component that's 1 because you'll always have just one component that you're taking to be the reference component so the one that you've taken to the reference component the relative volatility of that one Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, the question was basically will you always have one component that has a relative volatility of one? Uh, and the answer is yes, because you have to add up every single component. And as you have to pick one component as a reference component, you will always end up with one component being the relative volatility to itself. So you always end up with a single one, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You've got to be careful with which assumptions have been used to derive each question. So with the Underwood equation, <clears throat> any component in your mixture can be a reference component. For the Fenske equation, if you look at the if you look at the equation, I'll just flash it up. You'll notice that the relative volatility you use is the relative volatility of the light to the heavy component. Okay, because of that fact, it is therefore normal that the reference component you use. Is always a heavy key. Okay, because then you don't have to remember to change it. You don't, don't need to change it when you get to the fancy equation. You can just use the same all the way through. So that so it's typically taken that the heavy key is a reference component. Okay. Right. Okay. So now we've got our Theta value, we can sub this back in to the second half of the Underwood equation, which is based on the distillate. Okay, so again, we we'll start with the propylene first, so it's obviously still the same average relative volatility, but the fraction in our distillate, remember, wanted to be 99%. And of course, we know our theta value is 1.159. And then we have our second term for our butane. So again, relative volatility of 1 times by our fraction in the distillate, which is 0.1. And again, we have the same phi value. So all we need to do is count work that out, and it comes to 1.495. So our R min is 0.495. Okay. So if we move on to part C, 
So part C then asks us, well, what is the minimum number of stages needed for the separation? So if we go back to our handy, handy set of equations, we're given the Fenske equation, which is our n min. So we can write down our Fenske equation, fraction of the light to the fraction of our heavy key and the distillate and the fraction of the heavy to the light and the bottom product over the log of the relative volatility between our light and our heavy key. Okay, so this is just a case of plugging in the information that we've already written down for our system. So we know that the light in the distillate is 0.99, the heavy is 0.01, the heavy in the bottom is 0.97, so the light must be 0.03. And we still use our same relative volatility between propylene to butane, which we calculated in part A, uh, which is 3.18. That gives us a value of 6.98. But remember, you can't have part of a, of a stage. So we have to round up to the nearest number of stages. So we would expect seven, yeah? Do you always round up? Do you measure like six point one? Yeah, so so if, if N min had come out to be six point one, yeah. uh, that means if you think about it, what that means is is you need more than six yeah. stages. So six wouldn't be enough, so therefore you must round up to seven. Yeah. yeah. to part D. Part D then gives us five different components and asks us to think about how we would separate these five different components. And it suggests, it says, suggests two distillation sequences that both contain complex distillation columns and explain why these sequences might be the most economic option. Okay? So the first thing that we need to do is look at our table and what we see is that the relative volatility are given relative to component IC5. So that's fine for trying to design the columns with the shortcut methods, but what we need to do to think about whether we can use some of the distillation options, thinking about which separation is easiest, is we actually need the relative volatility between adjacent components. So what we can do is add on our own extra column to look at the adjacent components. So as I forgot to write them down, I'll actually have to calculate them. So the first one is obviously 4.36 
4.36 divided by 2.36. So we've got about 1.85. And that's the relative volatility of C3 related to the IC4. The next one is that's one. So that's the relative volatility of IC4 to NC4. Then this one I can do without a calculator, because it's 1.88 divided by 1. So that's the relative volatility between <coughs> NC4 and IC5. And then And then we don't have one for our last component. So what we've done there is we've just taken the relative volatility between the adjacent components so we can judge how difficult relatively the separations between the components are, which we couldn't easily do by looking at that relative volatility to IC5 list. Okay? <clears throat> So because our, the question actually tells us that the two, distillation col the two distillation sequences must contain a complex distillation column, what we want to do is look at our <coughs> list of materials and think, well, <coughs> which complex distillation column might be useful for to separate some of these together. So, <clears throat> if we look at potentially the, the bottom three components, what you notice <clears throat> is that the middle component is very clearly the major fraction if we're ignoring the, the top two components. The middle component is clearly the major fraction. The flow rate of NC4 and the flow rate of NC5 is very similar, so both 10%. And the relative volatilities of 1.88 and 1.82 are very similar. Okay? So what we've got is the major stream of the middle component, two equalish flow rates of the of the most volatile and the least volatile, and very similar relative volatility. So immediately that streams pre-fractionation. Okay? So if we went for a pre-fractionation column on those bottom three <coughs> components, obviously the first thing we need to do is remove C3 and IC and IC4 from that, that set of materials. So, if we look at our list, if we try to split between NC4 and IC4, that has the smallest relative volatility, so that is the most difficult separation. So, we don't want to do that first, we want to try and leave that as late as possible. Okay? So, one of the other heuristics we can think of is, well, let's try the direct, let's do the direct sequence. So if we do the direct sequence, what we do is we split our most volatile component off first. Then we split our next most volatile component, and then what we're left with is our 
three components that we thought would be very nice be separated by a pre prefractionation prefractionation column. Okay, so that is potentially our first good distillation sequence. And the reasons are we've gone direct sequence first, which is one of our heuristic rules. And then when we've looked at our prefractionation column, our IC5 flow rate is large. The flow rate of NC4 is approximately that of NC5. And the relative volatilities of four are approximately equal in the separations <coughs> that are going to be achieved. Okay? So that would be our potentially good first sequence. For our second sequence, again we want to start down the same the same line and think, well, if it's got to contain a complex distillation, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, pre the pre, the pre fractionation column comes before the main distillation column, and the whole unit is pre -fraction, fractional distillation. So that separates those three components. The first step, the first step is just a normal distillation column to separate off C3 at the top and the other components at the bottom. The second column is just a normal distillation column to separate the IC4 off at the top and the other components at the bottom. And then the final three components you then put into the technique of prefractionation with the prefractionator at the front and then the large distillation column behind. Yeah. So for our second sequence, again, we want to think, well, what could we find target of a complex distillation column? So if we look at our components, we notice that our C3 component, that has the lowest composition. Okay, so that's a very low fraction. And our next component is quite high, 35%. So immediately we're thinking, well, maybe we don't need a full column to do that separation because of how, how small amount of that first component is. So maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's a side stream or maybe one of the, the, the thermally coupled columns. In this case, because the minor component is the uh, is the most volatile component, we'd be thinking of a side stripper. So do we need a side stream or a side stripper potentially to separate those three components? What we'll do is we'll come back to that, but to leave those three components by themselves, we need to remove our IC5 and our NC5 from that list of components first. So if we think about removing our NC5 component first in our first column and then removing our IC5 component in our second column. So we would potentially have C3 So that would be potentially our first two distillation columns. <clears throat> so if we think about our design heuristics, what might be good about that sequence? Well, it's not the very first step, but quite early in our sequence, relatively early in our sequence, 
we'll actually be moving the IC5, which is our major component. So we're moving a large component relatively early in our sequence. So that's a plus for this sequence. So that would be remove large first. Also, when we're removing that component, we've already removed the 10, so we've got 40 versus uh, 50. So that's near enough a 50-50 split. Yeah? So that's another plus because one of the heuristics is favour sequences that give you a 50-50 split. So we also got a pro because it's a 50-50. And we've not separated our 1.26 yet, which is our most difficult separation. So we're leaving our most difficult separation to the end. So we've got three of our heuristics there showing us that this might be a very promising sequence. The only one that it goes against is favour the direct sequence. Okay? So now we're left with these three components. And I suggested we could use either a side string column or a side stripper to separate these components. So if we now look at our table and we look at our flow rate of the components, Because we remove 50% of our field, essentially these numbers double to 10, 70, and 20. So that's our relative flow rate. So for a side stream, we need about 5 or less percent of being our minor component. So it can't be a side stream. However, for a side stripper, what we need is for this middle component to be greater than 30% and the flow rate of this component to be greater than our top component. And we've got that. So therefore, we can do this as a side stripper. Okay, and that's because IC4 is greater than 30% and NC4 is greater than C3. Okay? So what we've done there is we've identified two different distillation sequences, both with complex columns in, and we've justified why either of those two could be a good system. Okay? Sorry. Yep. Why, why do we remove NC5 first? Why do we remove NC5 first? Uh, IC4 is the most difficult separation. 1.26. The, the relative difference between 1.88 and 1.82 is, is nothing really. But 1.26 is very clearly the most difficult, and the other the three are basically the same So the final question, the first part asks us to look at a liquid-liquid extraction system. <laughs> <laughs> so it tells us what we're trying to do is design a system to separate acetic acid from isopropyl ether by adding water to that system. 
and then it provides us <coughs> then it provides us with the composition and amount of both the feed and the solvent that we're using in the system. So part A actually asks us to use those two those two systems to calculate the composition of the combined mixture. So we know that obviously the total amount of the combined mixture must be equal to the feed plus the solvent. So that's 200 of each. So we know that the mass of our total mixture is 400 kilograms. We can also do a mass balance on each component. So if we do that on A, we know that the amount in the mixture is equal to the amount in the feed plus the amount in the solvent. So we're told that we've got 30% in the feed plus zero in the solvent. Divide that by the total mass of the mixture and that gives us 0.15 or 15% of our acetic acid in the mix. We can then do this with our isopropyl ether. So we've got 0.7 in the feed, plus nothing in the solvent. That gives us 35% of the isopropyl ether in our mix. And the final one for our solvent. So we know we've got nothing in the feed, but it's 100% in the solvent. Divide that by the total feed mix. It gives us 50% in mix. <coughs> so the next part of the question <coughs> tells us that the raffinate product that we actually want has less than 5% the solute in it. Okay, so that's the acetic acid. <coughs> and then we're provided with a personal diagram, and what we need to do is use that information to draw the extract and the raffinate point. <coughs> so here's the ternary diagram that we're provided with. So, I know what helps a few people is if the first thing you do is you have a look at the, the axes and think, well, what do my corners mean? So if we look at the mass fraction of acetic acid, we can see that it's increasing up here, so that our acetic acid, our A, must be at this top point. Our mass fraction of water, is increasing towards the bottom corner, so this must be our solvent and our mass fraction of isopropyl ether <coughs> is increasing across the bottom, so that must be our carrier, our pure carrier in that corner. 
So the first thing we want to do is draw our feed point and our solvent point onto this system. So our feed is 30% acetic acid, 70% isopropyl ether and no water. So we know that must lie on this axis and it's 30% acetic acid. So that is our feed point. We can also plot our solvent point. Our solvent is pure solvent, so we can plot that in that corner. We also know that our mixing point must lie on a straight line between those two. And what we can do is we can use the calculation that we just did in part A to plot that on. So we know that it's 15% uh, acetic acid, 35% isopropyl ether. So 15% acetic acid. So it should be somewhere around. So it's approximately there and that's fine <coughs> for the system. So you can see it's lying on, it's lying on our straight line between our S and our F. It's approximately 15 for our acetic acid and it's approximately 35 for our isopropyl ether. Okay? Can't we just use the 50% for water? Oh, I'm not drawing it quite on 50% water. <coughs> Sorry, that's a terrible. Sorry, that is just a terrible drawing. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The easiest thing to do is just use the 50% line for the water. There we go. <laughs> Still works out about 15%, about 35%, and then on the 50% line for the water. Yeah. Yeah. Top tip for the exam: ask this guy where to plot the mixing point. <laughs> yeah. Um, you potentially have to plot. Equilibrium data in the tie line. So I'm I'm aware how long it takes to plot the equilibrium data in the tie lines. So that's why I would not ask you to plot an entire curve. I might say provide you with the curve and say plot these three tie lines onto the curve. If you're not going to get a huge table of have to plot all the because it just takes too long. So still you need to know, but in an exam, it's a bit long winded. <coughs> okay, so we need to, to plot the raffinate and the extract product points. So we're told that we want five weight percent or less of the solid in our raffinate. So we know that our raffinate must lie on our equilibrium curve. Our raffinate side of the curve is over here. And we want approximately 5% of our acetic acid. So we can plot our raffinate point Rn here. Now because it's a multi-stage separation, we know that our extract and our raffinate are linked by a mass balance and that mass balance passes through our mixed composition. So we can find our extract point 
by drawing a straight line there. <coughs> and that is our extract point. <coughs> the next part of the question asks us to calculate the number of stages needed to achieve these particular products. So, to do this, we need to first of all plot our operating point. So, to find our operating point, we know that the raffinate, the solvent, and our operating point all lie on a straight line. And we also know that our feed and our extract and our operating point all lie on a straight line. So we can draw two straight lines and unfortunately it was only when doing the calculation I realised I didn't leave enough room on the paper. <laughs> Though in the exam That'll do. <laughs> In the exam, however, <laughs> I have tested it, and if you do need, if you will need to do it for the exam, it will fit onto the paper provided. <laughs> I will not ask you to get a piece of sticky tape and stick an extra bit of paper on to plot the operation. <laughs> So now we've drawn our operating point, we need to look at our stages for the separation. So what we do is we start at our extract and we first of all do an equilibrium stage. So we can see we lie part way between two tie lines. So about a third of the way from the top tie line, so we can go about a third of the way from the top tie line on the other side of a the diagram. Then we can go all the way to our wonderful operating point. To draw our operating line. And then again, we use this, and we're very close to an equilibrium line to draw our next equilibrium stage. And what we find is, is that in, only, in this case, in only two stages, we're below that specified raffinate composition. So the number of stages we need Two. So, a tip, a tip for the exam if you're drawing, um, you'll notice if you've read all the exam rules that you're not allowed to answer an exam in pencil. Okay, but there is nothing to stop you drawing a pencil and then going over the correct answers in pen afterwards. The problem with drawing in pencil is if there's any problems and you want to show your exam script to anyone to, because you think there's a, been a mistake in the marking, because it's pencil, we don't know if you wrote that or not. You could have wrote that just because you could have rubbed out the wrong answer. That's why you have to write in pen. Yeah. Uh, we do, so, uh, 
Well, I'll mark the pencil. If you do it in pencil, I'll mark it. Don't look back. <laughs> so if you were to write in pencil, I would still mark it. It's just... Uh, yeah. um, it's a good question because that's down to how many copies of the exam. I don't know how many copies of the exam the originator has. has with them. There's generally a couple of spares, but I would be careful. The, the other thing is, is you can use two colours because you're allowed to use both blue and black pens. So you can use two colours if you want to make your drawing more clear, but you can't use any other colours than blue or black. That's not my rules, that's just the example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the quick question there was just, I just said there were two stages, but I didn't essentially show you or count the number of stages. So the easiest way to calculate the number of stages is after you've drawn your diagram, count the number of equilibrium lines that you have drawn. So I've drawn one, two equilibrium lines. Okay? So, there's two equilibrium lines, so there's two stages. Okay? <coughs> I'm aware that it's five to five. Do you want me to do the very last bit? Yeah. yeah. So the fight, uh, part D says that we've got a, a mixture of hydrogen and ethane and we want to try and separate these two components using a membrane. And then we're told that we've got a one mil thick porous membrane with an average pore size of 20 angstroms, a, pure, a porosity of 30%. And we can assume that our tau value is 1.5. So we're told that the pressure on either side of the membrane is 10 atmospheres and the temperature is 100 degrees. So we want to calculate the ideal separation factor for the system. So if I can find it. So if we look on our, our sheet of handy formulae, we can see that we're given two equations related to membranes. The first being the permeability of gas for a porous material, which is convenient because we have a porous membrane, and the Knudsen diffusion coefficient, which for a gas fits into our permeability equation. <clears throat> so the first thing that we want to do is to calculate the Knudsen diffusion coefficient for each of our two materials. So from our formula sheets, we know that the Knudsen equation is that. So all we need to do is plug in the relevant information in the correct units. So for hydrogen, We plug in the diameter of the pores, which is 20 angstroms. 
we're told what an angstrom is, but we need the unit in centimetres. Now, I've not given you the conversion of centimetres to metres. Um, <laughs> I hope that you might remember that. Uh, so, <clears throat> we know that it's 20 times 10 to the 8 centimetres. We need the temperature. We're told that the temperature is 100 degrees C, but we need the temperature in Kelvin. Okay? I don't mind if you want to use 273 Kelvin to add on, or 273.16. I don't mind which one, but the temperature in Kelvin is 373, and then we need the molecular weight, and we're told that the molecular weight of hydrogen is 2. Okay, so we can calculate that our Knudsen diffusion coefficient is 0.0132 centimetres squared, and again we know it's centimetres squared because it tells us in our useful formula sheet. We can repeat exactly the same the ethane. The only thing that's different is we need the molecular weight of ethane, which we're told is 30. So we get 0 0.00342 centimetres per second for the Knudsen diffusion coefficient of ethane. So because we're going for the idea of separation factor, we need our permeability. So this is our equation for the permeability, and you can see we've got this term in here for the essentially the effective diffusion coefficient. So just to break it down, I'm going to If you remember that equation, then that's where we get that term from. So that's our effective diffusion coefficient. So we can calculate that value for both the hydrogen and the ethane. So, if we want to do it for hydrogen, we're told in the question that Di, which if you remember is our normal molecular diffusion, we're told that at 100 degrees C, we can take it as 0 0.086 for both whether it's hydrogen or the ethane. Okay. Six plus one over our Knudsen diffusion coefficient for hydrogen. So our effective diffusion coefficient for hydrogen is 0 0.0114 centimetres squared seconds to the minus one. We can do exactly the same for the ethane. Two. Three, two, nine centimetres squared minus one for ethane. 
you can now take the, the equation for the permeability. As we know that our permeability of the material is the, the porosity RT tortuosity times by our <coughs> effective diffusion coefficient. <coughs> so if we can do we can do that for hydrogen. So we're told that the porosity is 30%. If we look at our unit. We've got centimetres squared per second for our diffusivities. In the question, we're told the pressure in atmospheres. Therefore, it's useful if we give our permeability in atmospheres and units of centimetre. But I don't mind, you could give it a different unit if you wanted to, so long as it's correct. However, Here's a hint that I might want it in centimetres and atmospheres is the, that I've given you the, the value of the ideal gas coefficient in centimetres and atmospheres. Okay? So just check the units to make sure your units are balancing as you go along. So we've got R times by our temperature times by our tortuosity. 1.5 and then for hydrogen our effective diffusivity moles centimeter centimeters per second Okay, so that's 7.45 times 10 to the minus 8 moles centimetre per centimetre square per second per atmosphere. Okay? So it's the flow rate times distance divided by the area per unit time per unit pressure. Okay, that's the definition of permeability. <coughs> we can do exactly the same for our ethane. Again, it's the same membrane, so it's the same porosity, it's the same ideal gas coefficient, same temperature, same tortuosity. The only difference is the effective diffusivity, which the ethane is 0.0329. So that gives us 2.15 times 10 to the minus 8 mole centimeter centimeter squared per second per atmosphere. The question asks us for the ideal separation factor. The ideal separation factor is the ratio of the, permeabil the permeabilities of the components. And remember that you want to write that ratio in such a way that the separation factor is greater than 1. So in this case, the component with the, the greatest permeability would be on top, which is the hydrogen. But you would expect hydrogen to go through the membrane faster because it's a smaller molecule. <coughs> so our ideal separation factor from relative hydrogen over ethane, <coughs> that's 7.45 over 2.15. So our ideal separation factor. 3.47. Okay? <clears throat> the last part, part E, asks us what are the main advantages of using an asymmetric membrane 
compared to other membrane types. So, nice easy question just to finish the exam paper with. A little remembrance of, first of all, you have to remember what an asymmetric membrane is. So, an asymmetric membrane is a composite membrane. You have your micropores membrane, and then a dense membrane layer. Okay? So you've got both porous and dense membranes together. Normally, your dense membrane is a very thin layer. Okay? So what's the advantages of combining those porous and the dense membranes together? Okay, so the main advantages are you've got a dense membrane. The dense membrane, because it doesn't have pores, gives much better separation than, than a porous membrane. So because you've got that dense membrane layer in there, you've got good separation. You can still achieve a good separation. But the permeability <coughs> through the dense membrane is very low. So, to get a high permeance, you have to have a very, very thin dense membrane layer. Okay? So you have a very, very thin dense membrane layer, high selectivity, potentially high permeance, <coughs> both advantageous. But now, because it's really thin, it's really fragile. That's where your porous membrane comes in, that's attached to it. <coughs> your porous membrane, nice and porous, so it has a high permeability, high permeance, so you can have quite a thick layer. That supplies the rigidity of the membrane to make sure your membrane doesn't break. But because of the, por the porous part is most of the membrane, you still have the high permeance through your membrane. So high flow rate and high selectivity best of both the two membrane types. Um, quite, if there's no particular question, then that's it. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.